like to welcome everybody to today's EOL seminar and thank you for finding us. We, At the point we scheduled it, the auditorium was booked, but it turns out we could have been there anyway. But uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Vivek. He told me everyone knows him so he doesn't need an introduction, but there might be some people web listening to the webcast on Mars who don't know. So um, I should just briefly explain that uh, got your PhD in electrical engineering, Colorado State. Um, while you were doing that, you were a GRA here and uh, have continued pretty much, not completely unripted, and now as a senior scientist with EOL. Um, Vivek was a former head of the remote sensing facility in EOL for a while, and I guess I should just have to mention two honors. One is a senior member of the IEEE, and as many people know, uh, just this year is an AMS fellow. So uh, I think with that, I'll let that perfect start. And yes, there's still some seats up, especially up front. Thanks, Jay, for the kind words. Uh, uh, this talk is very broad. Uh, coverage, uh, it does that uh, design, oh, okay, design development and uh, deployment, it could be three different seminars really, uh, but I thought I can do just a one 45 minute seminar. So I'm just presenting, this work has been done by a number of people here, the HCR team, as you see on the bottom, the Al Cooper here, and uh, he was really a person, uh, basically gave us a project to work on this. Um, and many people from uh, UIL, various facilities, uh, including uh, Design Fabrication Lab, computers, and RSF and RAF really helped us to build this uh, radar. Um, <clears throat> the problem is basically why we need the radar. Uh, look at the cloud microphysics. If you look at basically for a given DBZ values, say minus 20 DBZ echo here, this is the uh, DBZ value here, x-axis is the liquid water content log scale. <coughs> then for, say, minus 20 dBZ, a drizzle, which is all the drizzle by red color here, a much lower liquid water content. For the same values of minus 20 dBZ, the cloud droplets will be much higher, factor of 10 higher liquid water content. Hence, you want to estimate liquid water content, you need to know the droplet size. Otherwise, much more difficult to get the drop liquid water content estimate. And so we need a system which can do very sensitive, like you're talking about uh, uh, much lower DBZ values. At the same time, can it estimate droplet size so that we can distinguish between liquid water content, whether for a drizzle or a cloud droplets. With that motivation, uh, there's a need to build this uh, <coughs> cloud radar. This radar, uh, in an outline, I'll give system description, I'll go through that. Then, <clears throat> what kind of accuracy is we can measure the wind and the power measurement? I'll go through some of those. Then as the airborne system, it needs the corrections for, because it's a moving platform, measuring a wind, it's not that easy. We are talking about measuring wind, tenth of a meter per second, the platform moves hundreds of meters per second. We gotta be careful how we measure the wind. Some calibration issues. Then I go through algorithms, could estimate droplet size and liquid water content, how we can do that with the measurements. And also some deployments recently we did in CSET in, uh, over the ocean, the cloud system ev evolution traits. That's the outline of my talk. To begin with, um, there's advantages for airborne millimeter wavelength radars. Basically the high sensitivity, <coughs> just because the particles are smaller, the Rayleigh again, you can see, but compared to a S-band measurement, at a W band, you can get a K and 40 dB enhancement due to lambda power four, and also the with the W band 60 dB. Even though the power transmit is just a one one kilowatt peak power compared to uh, S-port, the one megawatt, but because of a sensitivity in the Rayleigh again, we can detect small particles. Uh, then in the airborne platform, we got a much better spatial and temporal resolution. The second 10 to 100 meter resolution could be done just because it's a 90 gigahertz radar, got a lot more independent samples. You can get a very good measurement, fine scale measurements could be done. 
Um, the Brack scatter is not a big issue in this case uh, because it's 40 dB or lower compared to uh, other frequencies. And so you don't have to get confused between Brack versus Brack meaning reflectivity from a temp uh, basically temperature humidity fluctuation. That won't impact your cloud measurements. That are good at, that are advantages. Again, the size is quite small because it's a 90 gigahertz radar. It's a, a, we can get a much finer beam width with uh, just a small size antenna. And so this is about 0.7 degree beam width, the 12 inch uh, lens antenna. And so it's a very good resolution what we get for the size. There are some disadvantages with the airborne configuration. A uh, lot of attenuation. For example, gram per meter cube liquid will give rise to about 0.8 dB at Ka band and a 4 dB at W band. Uh, in, in terms of uh, disadvantage, there are advantages. Sometimes you can use that to estimate liquid water content itself because it's highly attenuating. It's possible to use that to our advantage. But in general, we can't penetrate deep into the cloud. We can't look at very high dBZ uh, measurements with the millimeter, radar cloud, millimeter radars. Um, in the airborne platform, we got a limited dwell time, and that makes it difficult to get a lot more independent samples, higher sensitivity. But still, we are pulsing it much faster, 10 kilohertz, compared to 1 kilohertz in uh, ground-based radars, and you get uh, 10 times more samples than what we get. And that makes it much better to get a uh, uh, good sensitivity. But still, in a ground-based configuration, we can get a higher sensitivity if you do that. Uh, again, a platform motion effects needs to be corrected because it's a moving platform. Uh, same time, the spectrum width, which is a dot spectrum width, is smeared because of moving platform configuration, and so you got to correct for that. And there are plus and minus millimeter radars. There are there are many radars in the world. There are millimeter radars listed in this table here. Uh, Wyoming cloud radar here. We have a cloud radar here. They have a 95 gigahertz radar. Then a Japan has radar. Then uh, <coughs> look at uh, Canada. Uh, um, they have the radar here, uh, uh, basically, then uh, the NASA has this radar, JPL. Um, again, Goddard has EDAP and CRS, uh, then French have this radar here. There are all various configurations. There are millimeter frequencies. The big difference is our radar is in a pod. That's much different than other radar systems. Other radars are in a cabin-based cabin system, or it's a belly pod. It's much easier to control. The radar, what you're doing, describe, it's in a pod. In a G5, the, the cabin space premium. And we have to put this radar in a part so that we could scan and also take measurements. Um, in the part based system, there's a lot of challenges how we build this radar system. That's the big challenge, engineering challenge here, building this radar. So if you look at it, most of the radars have many different configurations. They have a polarization, multiple beams. Multiple beams helps to get the Doppler measurements like a, more than a 1D Doppler measurements. Then polarization measurement tells between liquid and ice phase. The, all these radars have a one way or other uh, polarization or multiple beam uh, things. Now the radar, what you're going to describe today, the hyper cloud radar, it's mounted on the right wing of the G5. That's the part outside it sits there like that. It's a radome there. It's basically if a close-up view on a ground base. That's how it looks like that with all the probes. In a um, ground-based radar, like a S-band radar, uh, it's easy to do some ver verification validation uh, because we have uh, rain gauges where we can collect these measurements, compare the radar measurement. In a cloud, non-precipitating to the ground, it's much more difficult. We need to have some of those probes so that we could validate what we do, the, uh, what we collect the measurements. And so it's, it's a good a match having a cloud radar on airborne platform where we could estimate liquid water or particle size at the same time we could able to uh, uh, verify with these uh, probes on the, uh, on the on the airplane this radar was built in a stages like if you see here it was on a bench for a number of years it took a while to put all this high power electronics data systems into a part the part looked like that the part is basically about uh, 160 inch long, 20 inch diameter. It can carry up to 800 pounds. This radar itself weighs about 500 pounds. And so it, it's built within that part. Then part as a pressure vessel, all the high power electronics. We got a transmitter and a modulator, 
they're all packed in hyper uh, in the pressure uh, pressure vessel here. Then the lens antenna here with the scanner. By this you can scan, except the fuselage area, you can scan this uh, system. The data system is outside. The pod is maintained uh, at about 15 psi as the altitude changes from ground up to 40,000 feet. Pressure level drops, temperature drops. And the temperature and the pressure maintained at almost constant level it, using an active pressurization system here. So that's how the radar is uh, built. Now, this is the other drawing, the same the part system here. You can see we have basically uh, all the uh, hyperelectronics and data systems in the back, then antenna in the front, and there are some navigation systems, the uh, GPS in the front, so that we can correction for platform motion. Okay, this is a brief description about timeline. This radar took close to about 10 years to build it. There's a reason why it took that long. Uh, the contract was given to university to build this radar to begin with, but they declined it for a reason for that, why they declined it. Then we got to start from the scratch, because NSF can't just give us a contract to build this radar system. We got to back the square one, we go to the community, get for evaluation, what needs to be done, how, what's the requirement currently. We got to do the, all the survey. The, for that, we got a small seed money. A email survey was conducted in community. See whether you want to build a multiple beams or with the uh, dual wavelength, K and a W band, or with a single frequency. And there are many options how we can do this. The survey came out and said basically they need a dual wavelength radar system with a polarization option. That's what the survey basically told us in the community. It was a hyper radar hyper advisory committee in May 2005. About uh, the concept basically approved was dual polarimetric, dual wavelength system, the scanning configuration in a 20-inch part as a 26-inch part originally planned. This is basically how we evolved into uh, in about 2000-2005. Then finally, the work began about 10 years ago, November 2005. Team was finalized. It's, uh, it's about um, with the help from NSF, we started building this, uh, <coughs> building this radar. It took about four to five years to build a ground-based system because before we got the airborne system, we need to test it clearly the ground-based system. It took a while to make that thing. During that period, the same engineers work on developing the system, also deploying our other radar system. We had uh, two major programs, one in Taiwan, other is in uh, Guam, the airborne radar and the ground-based radar, yes, Paul. So these are multi, almost like a year-long preparation to do that. And this all took place in between 2005-2009, deployment and also development. So there are some uh, issues with that. <coughs> Once we completed the ground-based system, the money ran out because there's that initial budget we didn't have that much money. The transmitter itself cost a lot more because all the components on a G5 should be FAA certified. It's not just a ground-based system. It has to be FA certified. It takes a lot more money to make those highly certified systems. So we got our money in 2009 to make it airborne system. During that time, the part was completed. It took a while to make the part to be completed. Then it's all put in a pressure vessel with all the electronics. So about 2013, system was completed. Between 13 and 14, we had a number of test flights, the IDS, with the RAF help. We got good measurements. With that, are able to do the calibration, particularly for uh, measuring winds, and also a uh, system um, um, durability. Then, the dis uh, then there are displays are developed for quality control. Let's look at the data sets. In, uh, in this year, in January, we did an RE start deployment just for eight hours. Then the C set is about 120 hours of deployment uh, between uh, um, Sacramento and Hawaii. We got a lot of good measurement of shadow cumulus clouds. And that's a brief description how the system was built. Now, uh, the radar system is not complete. We don't see a block diagram here. So you see the radar system has basically a, a, a transmitter path here. You got a, a three circulators, which can transmit HRV. Currently, we transmit just one polarization, receive in two channels. We have a, a channel here. Uh, let's see, get my mouse. Yeah, there's the there's channel here, the two channel receiver here. 
The difference between the ground radar and this radar is it has a two higher frequencies at 1.4 gigahertz and at uh, one, 140, 150 megahertz. And the two different uh, higher frequencies so that we can get a much good performance. Then also we could have a noise diode for calibrating the radar, the receiver chain. Also we could sample the power so that we can monitor the transmit power. And there are a good amount of uh, uh, diagnostics built in the system so that we can monitor the system its performance in real time. Then we have, uh, again, uh, circulators here, about each of 25 dB here, isolation. That basically, uh, this antenna here, antenna system here, that isolates the receiver from the high power transmitter. And so we have, the, basically, we have uh, um, three switches, each about 25 dB isolation. This antenna pattern, it shows uh, the H and the v, v pole so that we can get a very good ZDR measurement if necessary. Then also cross pole measurements, which are much very good in this case, the lens antenna is much lower, 40 dB lower. That gives a very good dynamic creating cross pole measurement. That guarantees uh, the good dynamic range in cross pole, about more than 20 dB. That is necessary to discriminate between liquid and ice phase. This is the performance characteristics of the uh, system. It's about the important thing is about one uh, 0.7 degree beam width, the peak power 1.6 kilowatt. The sensitivity, it's about 43 dBZ at one kilometer that could be achieved. And that's a very good sensitivity. Most of the clouds, about minus 3 dBZ, you can measure under the gram per meter cube precipitation amount. And there's a good dynamic range, what we can do with this at one kilometer. The system is built so that it has very broad pass band. <laughs> Uh, compared to a ground-based radar, which is 1 megahertz, but it's a 20 megahertz. That will help us to uh, do a pulse compression. And this sensitivity, what we see, could improve by a factor of about 8 to 10 by pulse compression could be done in future if necessary. And so that's in, uh, that's in the works if you want to do it. And this system sensitivity is comparable to currently what we have in the community and a very good spatial and temporal resolution what could be achieved with the system. This diagram shows as a function of range is the distance from the radar. That's the minimum dBZ detectable. That's about one kilometer minus 43 dBZ. If you go to 15 kilometer, there are two different pulse length, I'm sorry. The solid line corresponds to a half a microsecond. The dotted line corresponds to a quarter microsecond pulse width. If you increase the pulse width, sensitivity improves by a factor of 6 dB, factor of 2, the 6 dB improves sensitivity. And so you got two different pulses could be transmitted, or even other pulse width could be done. And if you look at it, at um, half a microsecond pulse width at 15 kilometer, about minus 25 dBZ, it could be improved by 10 dB with the pulse compression. And so that's the idea I found, even farthest range. The aircraft flies about 40,000 feet, 15 kilometer is good enough range to look at all the way to the ground or from the looking up, from the ground up. Uh, these are some of the estimates what we can get. For a dBZ measurement, uh, the y-axis shows the spectrum width, the x-axis number of samples. What's shown here is the uh, accuracy of a dBZ or power measurement. As spectrum width increases, we get more independent samples. That way you get a much better sensitivity or accuracy. Then also at the same time, as the number of samples increases, you also get a much better, um, uh, uh, much lower, or uh, much better measurement of power measurement. And so just within about a tenth of a minute, sorry, tenth of a second, you get a thousand samples because it's pulsing at 10 kilohertz. And the thousand samples can get for a tenth of a second. By the time you travel about 200 meters per second, G5 travels, and so about talking about, uh, um, it's about 20 meters or so, then you can get enough number of samples to get less than half a dB uh, accuracy could be done with the dBZ measurement. And this is a very powerful system in that way you can get a very accurate measurement of dBZ measurement could be done, uh, spatially and temporally. In terms of Doppler measurement, this is the uh, accuracy in Doppler, two tenths of meter per second, this is the blue line. The signal to noise ratio, no, x axis, higher the signal to noise ratio, you can get a much better estimate of uh, uh, Doppler accuracy or radial velocity measurement. 
this number of independent samples. Typically, for a tenth of a microsecond, you can get 100 independent samples. With about 3 dB SNR, a single noise ratio, you can get actually about 2 tenths of a per second in Doppler measurement. In system, just without any complicated average, we can get half a dB accuracy and a two tenth of a per second measurement in velocity to be achieved with the system. This is an example of uh, measurement. It shows the stratiform cloud. The four panels here, this is that time <coughs> as the aircraft flew above. This is basically uh, um, the nadir pointing. Aircraft is looking down in this case. It's a DBZ measurement with the velocity measurement. It's a cross pole, the LDR measurement, the spectrum width measurement we have here. So as you see here, there's a nice uh, melting layer here. You can see very low cross pole measurement, so it's all uh, raindrops below. There's the ice melting into that. There's the ice phase here. And the velocity here, what we see here, about uh, most of them are um, weighted by the falling uh, uh, hydrometeors, and you can see they're all basically receding from the uh, radar and the width, the spectrum width measurement. And basically, it has dynamic range in uh, uh, DBZ measurement, more than 20 dB. As you saw, the, uh, the, the antenna pattern beam width with a very good dynamic range in cross-pole measurement. Then um, it, it could measure up to a very low DBZ, minus 30 dBZ echo, all the way up to even 20 dBZ or so. What I show is about 10 dBZ. And so um, it has a very good sensitivity over all the, <coughs> the measurement. This is about, uh, in 60 seconds, it's about 12 kilometer in distance between here to there as aircraft travels. And this is basically airborne measurement as we collected over a, a steady form uh, precipitation. And uh, I'll show you a measurement. This, this radar currently has just a one frequency, 95, uh, 94 gigahertz, three millimeter wavelength. We deployed the system in conjunction with uh, a LIDAR. The LIDAR is uh, a green light. Uh, as you see the green LIDAR here, HSRL. It's again uh, high, high resolution, especially high, high resolution. Then it's a very fine beam width, basically about 40 centimeters of beam width here in this case. And this in conjunction with this radar gives a very good measurement of cloud microphysics. In a, before we deployed this radar over the uh, airborne platform, this is a ground-based measurement. What we see here is uh, uh, in 2013, just in the Fortis parking lot, the radar measurement here, this is the DBZ measurement. Um, this is a Doppler measurement. These two are LIDAR measurements. This is a backscatter from LIDAR, the dipole measurement. And so we have a both radar and LIDAR at the same time as we collected, pointing the same direction almost. And uh, in this case, it's a light snow, minus 10 dBZ is a maximum dBZ echo in this case. It's all snow in this case. And uh, in the top, you could see very low dBZ, less than minus 30 dBZ echo on the top here. Um, you can see LiDAR, so it's a very strong return, just a small cloud droplets. This is very typical of LiDAR measurement. And uh, the cross-pole measurement, which is very low because all these spherical drops. And so from the LiDAR perspective, this is basically a, a supercooled liquid layer on the top, on the top of the cloud here. And uh, the radar shows also very low dBZ values. But actually, if you look at carefully below that very, deep, very low dipole measurement, there's a higher dipole measurement. It shows the ice particle tumbling from those clouds. And uh, this layer, even though shows as if it's a very low dBZ values, very low cross-pole measurement, actually mixed phase cloud, that could be uh, um, detected using a, a Doppler measurement. In this case, Doppler spectral measurement. Look at Doppler spectrum. What we, sh what we see is the power, radial velocity. This is just a one gate within that very thin liquid layer this thin liquid layer. You can see double peaks here. One is at uh, zero meters per second. That's correspond to cloud droplets, about, pi about less than minus, about minus one or 0.5 meters per second here. That's the ice particles. 
And within that mixed phase cloud, we could see there are two particles, basically both liquid and ice present, even though we don't see them just using LIDAR alone, the radar is able to detect that thing. And that's the beauty of deploying both radar and LIDAR concurrently. So this has a, a lot of potential to look at mixed phase clouds and also you can verify them. To do this correct, this all, air, this all this, what is the ground-based measurement, what I showed here? This could be put in ground-based or airborne platform. On an airborne platform, the winds what we measure is not only winds from particles from atmosphere, also any component aircraft motion which are projected into the ra radial beam of the radar. In that case, you get contaminated by the platform motion. We have to be careful. We got to unravel those platform motion from the radial velocity. That requires knowing the beam very accurately in function of pitch, roll, and drift of the airplane. That requires good calibration of the pointing angle of the radar beam. If you do that, then using a transformations, we can show, or we can be shown a number of times, the ground velocity as a reference, ground should move basically the zero meters per second. You can see here the velocity of the ground, which is close to about zero meters per second, airborne platform measurement. Hence, the winds could be measured with a tenth of a meter per second without any contamination from the airborne platform. And this, this is done in real time so that we can get the winds without any contamination from the airborne platform. And this requires a good amount of calibration how we do this. It's uh, adopter measurements well calibrated, even though it's a moving platform. In terms of uh, DBC measurement, because any bias in power measurement would give a huge bias in estimate of liquid water content or particle size. It has to be done uh, uh, properly. And so we have done a number of simulations to show we could do this calibration, because in the case of a uh, uh, S-band radar, we have a rain gauge measurement, we got a power measurement, phase measurement, many things. We can uh, solar cal, many things are available to us to calibrate precisely. For a 95 gigahertz radar, it is not that easy to do those computations and, um, and calibrations. And what we show here is a simulation here. The rain intensity varied between, between 5 to 15, the concentrations, and the particle size. For various microphysical uh, combinations, this is simulated DBZ values. What's interesting to see here is the case of a W band at a certain distance from the radar, say about 250 meters, per sec 250 meters from the radar, which has been shown see in the computations here, the DBZ values are about 19 DBZ, independent of precipitation rate, like talking about between 5 to 15, particle size varying that much. This is due to the mean scattering and absorption. There's a balance between misc and absorption, which makes it the DBZ value to a, a particular value, about 19 DBZ. That means we can use a light drizzle to look at the precipitation, then you can calibrate the system. This is an end-to-end -end calibration could be done. So there are ways you got to verify this because you can't claim just using just drizzle measurement and calibrate the radar, but uh, this could be verified independently. I will show you how we can do this. Hence, in general, if we calibrate W band system, then we can look at the light drizzle, we can do this calibration. And so this is very interesting. This has been published work on this in the JTAG, how they, can, how, how they have done it. The only problem with this is any time the radome gets wet, then a lot of absorption because of wetness of radome means be careful. You have to protect the radome. Also, this could be done only on ground based mode, not in air, an airborne platform, much more difficult to do, but unless you are not wet by the radome. Yes. Well, in this case, little bit, it's a light rain also included in this case. And so drizzle will work also in this case, yeah. yeah. This is a model computation. Then that's a measurement. This a measurement was taken, uh, again, in the footage, uh, a parking lot here in a slant way. Uh, what we see is the time. This is the height, the DBZ measurement. In this case, basically got strong melting layer. That's the melting layer here, the light precipitation event. And uh, take this measurement, this is Doppler velocity here, three panels of measurements of, uh, from cloud radar. This is actual measurement of uh, uh, a DBZ histogram taken somewhere in the rain here. 
that was about 17 dBz or so. This is slightly lower compared to what we expected, about 19 dBz in the previous thing. And so comparing that histogram with what we measured, we think HE are underestimating our dBz about 1.5 to 2 dB. That's the result of this uh, comparisons. The, that means there are ways we can basically uh, we can calibrate the system pretty good. But um, many times it, we have to. We can't just have a, just one way of calibration. We need to have a, one more way of how we can do the calibration. There are ways in the literature. They show. If you look at the ocean backscatter measurement because the ocean is a very flat surface. The backscatter from that. It's uh, very well known, depending upon its uh, ocean roughness and the wind and the angle, how we look at incidence angles. This is a table it shows using uh, from CloudSat with 95 gigahertz, various sigma naught. Sigma naught is a normalized radar cross section, basically a um, cross section on the surface. The various regions in the Amazon forest up to the uh, ocean here. So ocean has the highest backscatter cross section this normalized cross section. This is the cross section, the standard deviation. The ocean also has the lowest standard deviation. Hence, ocean backscatter could be used as a reference to calibrate your system itself. And this is done for multi-year cloud stat measurement. Gives a hope we can do independent way. In addition to the cloud measurement, we can look at the ocean and we can do the calibration. And this, uh, again, a uh, uh, same graph, the previous table shown as at about these uh, incident angles here, cross section in the y axis, about 10 degrees. This is the square of the angle here, what is shown. About 10 degrees, you can see the lowest dependence on ocean currents. That means the insensitive to ocean winds because there's a big change in ocean back cross section as the wind changes. And if you could measure the cross section at a 10 degree look angle, you get about 6 dB is your normalized cross section that basically tells our radar system very, very well calibrated. These are the measurements here. Um, this is the theory, model computation shows the same thing. This is again, look at incidence angles here, cross section here, what it shows the various wind conditions, things change. But this is a measurement of hypercloud radar. You can see as the incidence angle changes, same pattern evolves here like that. And if you can look at 10 degree look angle, can do the calibration. Hence, we can do two different ways. Look at the ocean surface or look at the light drizzling cloud. We can look at those two do calibration. And uh, these computations are these measurements in this case, they are also sensitive to water vapor absorption because these are clear conditions looking at the ocean. We're looking at about, say, 10,000, 20,000 feet. There's a water vapor or oxygen absorption. And so we need to estimate those so that we can get a better estimate of these cross sections. For example, look at two different days. Say this is a day, July 7th, over the ocean. This is a ocean cross section as function instance angles. This is a July 9th, again, over the ocean instance angle. They're much different. The difference about 3 to 4 dB, this could be due to water vapor difference between those two measurements. And if you have a good um, estimate a water vapor between your platform and the ocean, then we can estimate the cross-section of uh, from the ocean, then we can estimate uh, um, uh, hyper cloud radar uh, absolute power measurement. So, so far I described the system. Now, the next 15 minutes or so, I'll go through how we could use this to estimate uh, particle size and liquid water content. For that, uh, I got some uh, a very good uh, cloud droplet measurement, Drizzle and Cloud Droplet Unions, and gave me this from Workers Project. project. Workers was conducted uh, northern Chile in 2008. What we, sh what we uh, see here is uh, liquid water content from the in situ probes of uh, CPI and the cloud probe, with Drizzle probe, the event number. There are 94 events, the 4,000 droplet spectra collected. They're well quality controlled, the drizzle and cloud droplets. For that, liquid water contents are estimated basically between, um, this is in a log scale, one gram per meter cube, and a very small amount of liquid water content here. There's about 4,000 spectra in this, what we see here. Next one shows in situ measured radar estimated size. This is a D6 by D cube. 
it's a, you could see the particle size maximum is again a log scale. It's about one millimeter here. This is a much lower. This just one micron here. And so between these two curves, look at it. This is the liquid water content. That's a, a rather estimated size. The higher liquid water content, if you look at the yellow colors here, corresponds to a lower droplet sizes, blue color. And these are in situ measurements. For that, we computed a model radar measurement in 95 gigahertz, 94 gigahertz, so 3 millimeter, the radar measurement corresponding to that. This again, 4,000 droplet spectra. The altitude here, the, where it got measured. The maximum dBZ, about 20 or 22 dBZ in this case. And uh, these are all modeled for those each spectra we computed. Once we do this computation, then we need to do um, LIDAR because radar alone won't do the good job because we need a one more measurement here. This HCR uh, backscatter measurement. HCR backscatter measurement shown here is, um, shown here is uh, again the same, the height, as the event number here. As we see, there are values which are um, SCR, SCR reflectivity values are uh, basically about much lower in the case of uh, small droplets here and uh, minus 30 dBZ or so. This is the uh, HSRL, LIDAR reflectivity. LIDAR reflectivity is shown as a one over meter stadium. Then LIDAR reflectivity is much, actually if you look at it, uh, this yellow color corresponds to uh, much higher values. This corresponds to much lower values here. It's a, it's a backscatter measurements are simulated. With these two simulations, basically we have 4,000 droplet spectra from drizzle and cloud droplets. We could come up with algorithms to estimate droplet size and liquid water content. And uh, if you want to see the scatter plot between uh, radar and LIDAR measurements, that's how it looks like that. What we see here is a DBZ measurement from a 95 gigahertz radar this uh, LIDAR measurement at a green light. You can see they're not correlated. They, they are two independent measurements. One basically shows a D squared measurement as a D sixth measurement. And then that way there are two independent measurements. And that could be used to estimate droplet size liquid water content. Here is, a, here is a, uh, how we can do that. There are two plots here. This shows the droplet size was radar to LIDAR ratio, reflectivity measurement. And that using, just using the ratio between two backscatter measurement, radar and LIDAR measurement, could estimate the droplet size very precisely for liquid droplet case. So <clears throat> you can go up to, uh, say up to about uh, half a millimeter or so, but you've got higher values here, the lot of big scatter, maybe not that reliable, but up to about uh, 300 to uh, 400 micron, starting from about one micron also, we can estimate using the radar LIDAR measurement droplet size uh, very precisely. Once you know the droplet size, then we could estimate the liquid water content. This figure shows liquid water content versus reflectivity normalized by the size, what you estimated from that. Hence, the size is used, normalized DBZ values, liquid water content estimated. And so this algorithm here, by which using just radar, LIDAR backscatter measurement, could estimate droplet size as liquid water content. The only requirement is we need to have, these are the simulations where we didn't take account of the absorption, attenuation due to intervening mediums. And it has to be compensated. For a HSRL, for LIDAR measurement, um, this LIDAR being a high spectral resolution LIDAR, uh, we can get uh, attenuation corrected LIDAR measurement. And so it's not that many people have this kind of measurement. LIDAR is already corrected for attenuation because it measures scattering from uh, molecular scattering or really scattering. And so using that, they can correct for absorption or scattering losses in the atmosphere. And so HSR already corrected. In the case of a radar, we don't have that option. And so we need to have that correction. Then we can do a, a, a good job of uh, using the radar uh, DBZ in coordination with the LIDAR measurement estimate particle size, liquid water content. 
Now, to test this, the algorithm I showed you how you can estimate liquid water content particle size. I picked three different spectra from the ochres, what I showed you about 4,000 spectra. These are just three spectra from that I picked randomly from three events. You can look at the blue color, the event number one. The red is uh, event number 22. There are, there are many events here, about 40. Make a three different events. So these are basically a droplet spectra here. What we see here is this mainly a cloud droplets. It's in between. This again has a much bigger droplets. For three droplets, I tested the algorithm, how good it can do. Then these are the uh, simulation for those two, for those three profiles, right? This is that the blue with event number one, the DBZ values, and the height here shown, event number 22, again event number 40 here, the DBZ values. The LIDAR measurement here, LIDAR simulated measurements, again, we can see here. But you could see the radar measurement decreases with the height where the more lot of cloud liquid exists here. LIDAR, LIDAR backscatter increases because of small droplets. They are much different. The same thing here, radar measurement basically decreases here, LIDAR much there's, there's a lot of cloud droplets on the top of the cloud here compared to the bottom layer. Same with this here. And these are uh, two simulated measurements. Using that, then uh, we can estimate the droplet size. I'll show the results here. This is a corresponding droplet velocity. You can look at the smaller droplet, have a lower fall velocity. The bigger drops have a much higher fall velocity here. But, uh, these are the uh, retrieval, what we did, using the simulations of radar, LIDAR measurement. There are multiple curves here. The plus corresponds to what we retrieved. The star corresponds to what's the true value. You can see for the cloud droplets, we can, we can almost, we can, without much error, we can retrieve the, the cloud liquid water content. Very, very good. Again, with the, the plus and star almost falls on each other, the liquid water content estimate, again in, again in this case. In if you're able to estimate using algorithm what I showed, the liquid amount uh, without much difficulty here. Um, I think I missed one curve here. Yeah, this is the uh, droplet size estimation here, where it shows uh, the, the event number one has much lower um, 50 micron or so, much lower uh, uh, um, particle size, corresponds to uh, this one's much, little bit larger particle size. Again, particle size retrieved uh, in this liquid water content. And so you retrieve both liquid water content and particle size using uh, LIDAR, LIDAR measurements. <laughs> Now I'll show you the last part of my talk corresponds to recent deployments, where we did some measurements in a CSET, which is a cloud system evolution in traits. Uh, in this, we deployed on a G5, um, a, both in a zenith and the error pointing mode. The radar is located on a G5. The LIDAR is in a cabin, and the radar is in a part-based system. Then measure the aerosol measurements, or the cloud droplet measurement using the probes so that you can validate. Then, <coughs> again, HCR estimated platform corrected um, velocity. These are typical um, measurements in a, uh, during a CSAT. The graph here shows as a function of time, as active traverses here. Uh, the, basically, you can see from the, this is the nadir pointing mode, where HSR will measure the very good structure of uh, aerosol, and again, cloud tops. Again, when there are no clouds, you can go all the way to the ground here. Then this is a GV flight track, 20,000 feet. You can look at the, the DBZ measurement in a shadow cumulus cloud, the Doppler measurement. And these are the measurements collected about 120 hours uh, with a full Doppler spectrum. That way, we could retrieve um, uh, detailed uh, radar measurements if necessary. And these measurements are used for, um, <coughs> for characterizing uh, shadow cumulus clouds. One of the cases selected here, in this case, aircraft is in zenith pointing mode, flying close to about 300 meters, just above the ocean surface, looking up in this case. What we show here is uh, basically uh, a, a 60 seconds of a one minute. This is the height. It's a DBZ measurement. This is the velocity, Doppler velocity, and the linear depolarization measurement, the spectrum width, very fine scale measurement showing 
uh, uh, from the radar measurement. Then uh, most of the uh, velocity here are basically uh, weighted by the particle fall velocities. If you could correct for fall velocity, which is basically here fall velocity is estimated once you know the dBZ, then this is the ambient velocity. You can see a lot more positive values. The ambient velocity is much more uh, positive. There are some negative values here, fall velocities here. This is where aircraft are flying basically close to the uh, 300 meter here, looking up, take this measurement. Then we have developed some of the ways we can correct for, because radar is looking up now, all the way to the precipitation, we need to do corrections for any attenuation within the cloud system. And uh, this is the correction system what we used in the cloud. We could use the attenuation, the function of reflectivity. Or in a drizzle case, we can use equations like, like that. And it's using two different uh, sets of uh, correction schemes based on DBZ threshold, we can correct for um, absorption in the cloud. And uh, this is a close-up view of the same DBZ what I showed you in the previous uh, graph. Again, this is about uh, um, 60 seconds. This is the height, the DBZ measurement. This is a raw DBZ measurement. Okay, very low DBZ values here. Again, these are less than about 10 dBZ or so. And this is the attenuation corrected dBZ measurement. You can see the higher values when it got corrected. Again, you can see higher values here. It's corrected for attenuation. And so once you have the correct attenuation, then we have a LiDAR measurement coincident with this. The LiDAR measurement. LiDAR measurement shown here is for more than five minutes. The period is 1917 here onwards, but looking at this is a cloud looking at it. There's a drizzle cloud here, drizzle falling to the ground. These are the, this is a cloud droplets here, that smaller cloud. When you go back, and you can see these are the clouds here, small clouds here, and uh, this starts about 30 or 25, sorry about that, yeah, about in this time. And that's a corresponding LiDAR image. This is a backscatter measurement, the LiDAR measurement, and this is a dipole measurement in the LiDAR shows the drizzle cloud has a little bit higher dipole values than shows uh, very low dipole value get of cloud droplets here. You can see that. And so like uh, what I showed earlier about the algorithms using the LiDAR backscatter, LiDAR backscatter, we could estimate microphysics in this case. Then one other slide about LiDAR here. LiDAR uh, backscatter measurement, also we can derive extinction. Extinction is basically a uh, due to scattering in this case, a lot of extinction in the case of uh, uh, small cloud droplets. And uh, we have, in the case of LIDAR, the cross-pole measurement, backscatter, and extinction measurement, all three could be used. But for this study, uh, what I'm going to show, all I used was um, backscatter measurement from LIDAR and the radar. And uh, that's a, a product using the algorithm what I described earlier. I showed just uh, three points here. Um, very low DBZ values, but 14 micron droplet size with a very low liquid water content. This is about much larger particle size, about half a millimeter or so, tenth of a gram per meter cube, then much larger uh, liquid water content, 55 micron. This is using coincident measurements of radar and LIDAR. Uh, the C set, we collected these measurements, this yet to be put together on a same file or how we can combine those data sets. But I, I did that two different ways analysis and showing a very preliminary analysis. This could be expanded as we go along. And the radar itself has a great potential for, for estimating cloud liquid, particle size, liquid water content, and particle size. The same thing could be done for ice microphysics. The ice, in the case, a little bit more complicated because Ice has a different shape, different density. But this could be done. People have done this one. It could be looked into that. That will be the future work. So this is my last slide, a summary. What I showed is basically a uh, development, how we did the system uh, in the 10 years it took to do this. Uh, the first part was ground-based system. It could be a ground-based configuration with a much higher resolution, temporal and spatially. We can do that. Then also airborne system. This could be deployed in conjunction with the LIDARs, that, that way we have uh, two frequencies, one optical and a millimeter radar. In the future, in the radar itself, we'll have a KA band, that's 30 gigahertz, are two frequencies, and also pulse compression. That way we'll have much better sensitivity, and also it'll have a, um, two different wavelengths that gives a much better way of using 
using it to estimate cloud microphysics. Um, the cloud, basically, we collect a set of cumulus cloud. We have plenty of data set with that, and we are going to use that to develop some of the products, then also validate using the in-situ probes what we have done. The PIs from the uh, um, uh, University of Washington, Miami, they'll be working on this data set for a number, upcoming number of years. And a lot of interest in this kind of measurements. Uh, we plan to work with them to understand um, uh, cloud processes, cloud microphysics using these two data systems. I would stop here and take any questions if you have. Vivek, on your next to last slide, you had diameters listed in microns. That's a characteristic diameter of the drop size distribution, or what is that? That's a D6 by D cube, it's cube root of that. Median drop diameter or something? Yeah. It's, it's, a a moment, it's a moment of the drop size that's distribution. That's right. Drop and distribution. all the other, when you're retrieving the drop size distributions, and you, mm -hmm. you tended to speak to diameter as if it's a single thing, but that's a distribution of diameter. That's right. It's right. a statistic characteristic diameter. That's right. Yeah, it's a dis with D cube. It's uh, slightly bigger than a MED values. If MED, let's say, about uh, 300 micron, the what I showed you may be about 350 micron or something like that. And the reason why we use the radar estimated size, it's independent of drop size distribution because this could be characterized using the D6, the D cube. It's, uh, that's why it doesn't care about whether it's a gamma or a log normal, doesn't matter. And it's remotely want to estimate it. This is one of the ways we can do that. That's why I'm showing that. Yeah, this all a, a statistical distribution, yes, number, yes. So you're, you're really taking the velocity spectrum, the spectrum of velocities measured by the Doppler, mm -hmm. and inverting that to, to extract a drop size distribution as a function of diameter, is that? Not, not in this case. In this case, what I did was, Okay. Just use a backscatter measurement to estimate okay. it. But the technique what you're describing, using a, a droplet spectra from that estimating droplet size, people have shown that doing curve fitting could be done, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, the problem is in the ground-based measurement, maybe it's possible to do it. In the airborne platform, the droplet spectrum with itself gets smeared because of platform right. motion. It would be difficult to do that. We haven't done that yet. Not to hog it. Yeah. yeah. Earlier, you showed a slide where you were looking downward at the ground, yeah. and there were fluctuations, and you talked about removing the aircraft motion. Is there aircraft motion up and down also included in that? I'm not familiar with exactly yeah. all the Scott, translation. Scott could say that. Yeah, or is that, that, as you fly over the ground, you're actually looking at the, the ground moving up and down effectively because of the terrain, the mm -hmm. surface structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is Scott, that what's, is you that what those that? fluctuations are coming from? No, I don't think so. Yeah, Scott, do you want to comment on that? Uh, so the, the velocity correction does include the vertical velocity of the airplane. But there's still fluctuation in that. Yeah, it's a that there's a measurement the terrain, fluctuation. The structure of the ground is changing, like trees and stuff like that. As you fly over that, it's going to look like a tree is moving up because the tree itself has an angle. Right, I think that that could contribute to some of the noise that we see. Okay. Yeah. Those corrections, if I recall, that could be done with uh, uh, better than tenth of meter per second with a very low standard deviation error on that. And so it's been statistically it's been validated a number of times. So Vivek, you showed an example. Um, I, I think it was for calibration. We're at about 10 dBZ. Mm -hmm. uh, for a wide range of particle sizes yeah. and all that, mm -hmm. that you always got about 19, 19 what? 19, 19 dBZ for a light for, precipitation. For the, for the, right. So does that occur at any other set of parameters uh, with a widespread? I would say in the case of, uh, it's, it's true only for W band at about 250 meter distance from the radar. Oh, that but is only a, at 250 meters. That's right, 250, about 200 to 300 meter okay. around that range. There is a balance between uh, extinction, uh, uh, attenuation, and uh, mean scattering. That's why it causes that kind of number. It's been observed in CloudSat many times, uh, and it's also ground-based measurement that done. And that's why there are numbers they quote for a W-band. DBZ would never exceed 
more than 23 dBz, whatever it is, that's the number upper, uppermost. Anything if you 30 dBz, then something error there. Then if you have a melting layer, 23 dBz, ice, 21 dBz. These are the values well documented with the CloudSat measurement. And this all gives us a much better confidence what we do this. So with CloudSat, it wouldn't be at 250 meters. The, it, it must be range independent. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. They can actually, if you look at uh, in the case of uh, W band, it's uh, even attenuation to ice is very small, not much, except uh, scattering losses. Absorption is not much, and they can see through a lot of this precipitation events very good, yes. So, Vivek, uh, on your second last slide with your 500 micron particles and so on, yeah, mm -hmm. so um, if you have, a say, a 1 dB error in the uh, radar reflectivity, mm -hmm. how much does that change the results you're showing here? Uh, usually the radar dBz scales about square root in this case most of the time. And so 1 dB error could give us about 30 to 40% error easily. What to see in that? <coughs> yep. Yeah, Jim. <coughs> Yeah, I'm curious how the uh, the sensitivity of this cloud radar at W band compares, and the resolution compares with, say, the the Wyoming uh, W band radar. How does it compare? Um, the sensitivity is very similar. The 43 dBz at one kilometer minus 43 one kilometer is very similar. The Wyoming cloud radar has a multiple beams. They can go to the wind measurement, and uh, the beam width is similar, 0.6 degree beam, is that pay, is that, uh, and so I would say it's as similar. The only thing is in G5, the long endurance, and uh, we can scan the system, and uh, also um, with the LIDAR, what we have, with HSRL, the very few LIDARs are well calibrated, calibrated, and so these are the basically plus and minus, what look at it, and so uh, Wyoming King Air has a very good radar system. They can get the 2D wind measurements because multiple beams. Same kind of spatial resolution. Um, but uh, because the King Air, the endurance is lower compared to what you can do eight hours. And these are the big differences. We have we can scan. They don't scan that much. And uh, they're kind of fixed beams. They have multiple beams also. So each has its own plus and minus, the overall. If there's no more questions, thanks, Vivek. Okay. Thank you very much.